Okay, everyone. Hello. Uh, now we want to finish our discussion on uh, abstract machines and <coughs> compilation techniques. Uh, so, in the last lecture we were talking about the two modes of implementations. Uh, the purely interpreted implementation and the purely compiled uh, implementation. Uh, what we want to talk about now is what really happens in practice. Uh, because uh, in a way we could say that uh, the purely compiled and purely interpreted implementation can be considered as two extreme cases of, of, of what really happens in, in practice. Uh, so, for the case of interpretation, the interpreter actually often operates on an internal representation of a program which is different from the external one. So, instead of uh, interpreting the language uh, L, the, we are actually interpreting an internal representation of L. So we need to, or this is actually what often uh, happens in practice, uh, the uh, original notation of L is translated to an internal representation by first compiling L to an intermediate language. And it is the intermediate language that is uh, interpreted, not the original source language L. And on the compilation side, uh, some instructions for input and output are actually often translated into operating systems calls, which simulate at the runtime uh, and therefore, in a way, interpret the high-level instructions. So instead of uh, generating code that uh, uh, run output instructions or perform output or input, uh, which actually we would need a lot of machine instructions in able to be able to do that, Instead of doing that, some of the instructions for input or output are just translated by a compiler into direct operating systems calls, which are then run at uh, 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 runtime. The calls themselves, the calls to operating systems, are executed at runtime. Uh, and in a way, therefore, we are kind of interpreting the high level instructions by calling operating systems calls operating systems functions. So if we look at the, uh, the figure for the real case here, we have uh, a program written in, in the source language L. We have a compiler that compiles the source language to Li, which is the intermediate language. And after the compilation steps, we have a program that is actually written in the intermediate language. Uh, and we can we run the compiler on some abstract machine MA here. Now, once we have the program uh, written in this intermediate language, we use the abstract machine for the intermediate language. Uh, to uh, to execute the program. So the input to the abstract machine or to the interpreter is the program written in this intermediate language and the input data that we want to apply to the program. Uh, and we we might say here that we we run this. Uh, interpreter on, on uh, the abstract machine uh, MO. And the result of, of this whole process is, is uh, some kind of an output. 
So what we have here is that we have a compiler CLLI. So that's a compiler that translates L into the intermediate language LI. And then we have the interpreter ILILO, meaning, as you recall, a compiler that, uh, uh, sorry, an interpreter that interprets the language LI. And the interpreter is implemented in the language LO. So this interpreter runs on the abstract machine MOLO, which is the machine here on the figure. Uh, and this uh, machine thus simulates the machine MILI. So remember from our previous discussion that implementing the uh, the uh, uh, machine MILI, we do that by uh, writing the interpreter in the language LO on using the abstract machine MOLO. So, and this figure here is actually the uh, the real case for the Java programming language. So why is why is that so here? Well, because if we just uh, assume that the L here is is Java, so we have a program written in Java, the Java C compiler compiles our Java program L to Java bytecode. So LI is Java bytecode. And at that point, we have a program written in Java bytecode. Then we use the Java virtual machine, which is the abstract machine for the Java bytecode. That Java, that Java virtual machine might be written in, say, C++. So, uh, and note that, notice that that Java virtual machine has actually been probably compiled to be uh, run on a, on a, on a, on a particular uh, physical machine. And uh, the Java virtual machines both takes the program written in Java bytecode and the input data that we want to run, uh, that we want to give our uh, Java program uh, as input and it uh, returns some kind of a output as a result. So this real case is actually the typical case for, uh, for Java. Now, we had all earlier talked about these two uh, cases, purely interpreted implementation and purely compiled implementation. So in the case where we have ML is equal to MILI, in that case we basically do not have an intermediate language. So in that case we uh, are actually interpreting the original language. So we have a program written in L and we skip this compilation step here. We don't compile L to an intermediate language. We directly interpret the original source language. Uh, our language L. So th that's the case where we have a purely interpreted implementation. The purely compiled implementation is where we do not have an intermediate language, but we just uh, uh, generate code for the host machine. So going back, we have a program written in L. We, do, we have a compiler, but instead of compiling our uh, source language L to an intermediate language, we compile it directly to the language LO. So we, we again, we do not have this intermediate language step here. But in between, there are other possibilities. And as we said earlier, the real case is often kind of a mixture of uh, interpretation and, and compilation, as we saw for this uh, Java example. 
So in the case where these are all different languages or different abstract machines, ML is, is not equal to MILI, which is not equal to MOLO. Remember, ML is, is, is L is the uh, source language, LI is the intermediate language, and LO is the host language. Um, so if the interpreter of the intermediate machine is substantially different from the interpreter for the host language, we have what is called an implementation of an interpretive type. An implementation of an in interpretive type. So <clears throat> what this means is that, well, the difference between this solution and, and uh, the solution number one, where we have a purely interpreted implementation, is that uh, uh, not all constructs of the original source language L need to be simulated. So uh, there might be some constructs uh, f uh, that, that are directly, that have direct corresponding uh, uh, constructs in the host machine language. So we do not, would not need to si simulate them. Now for, the, for part B here, if the interpreter of the intermediate machine is similar as the interpreter for the host uh, uh, machine, we have an implementation of, of a compile type. Um, and in this case, uh, there might be, for example, uh, some input-output operations, as we mentioned earlier, that are, even when they are compiled, usually simulated by, by, sim by, by suitable programs written in, in the host, uh, host uh, language. So, uh, as we can see from this, uh, this distinction between the intermediate cases, basically between uh, what is uh, numbered here two, as uh, enumerated as uh, with the number two here, this is not really very clear. So um, there exist uh, uh, six uh, implementations uh, where everything is simulated uh, to cases where everything is compiled, and then uh, a, a lot of variance in between when parts are simulated and parts are compiled and so on. Uh, but at least it, it's, it's uh, important to, to understand that there exist purely interpreted implementations, and we have covered those. There exist purely compiled implementation, and we have covered those as well. And then there exist uh, um, uh, some, some uh, variants of those, or mixtures, combinations of those. And one, uh, one of the best known is, is the case uh, for Java. So, what do we try to do in, in, or tend to do in practice? Uh, well, we tend to interpret those language constructs which are furthest from the host machine language and to compile the, the rest. Um, and the reason why we, we, try, we tend to do this is that because um, it's easier for us to to interpret the constructs which are very, very high level as opposed to compiling them. Because if we need to compile them, we need to fight corresponding uh, operations uh, on the host machine, which can be uh, difficult. Uh, another thing that uh, is important uh, uh, in practice is that Compiled solutions are preferred when execution efficiency is desired, and we have we have also covered this that uh, if we compile, uh, well, uh, a compiled program runs faster than an interpreted one, because we only need to do the compilation once. Basically, we only need to decode the instructions once, uh, and then we run the compiled version of the program, as opposed to interpreting. Each, um, and decoding its uh, instruction on the fly every time that the program is is run. 
However, the interpreted approach is preferred when greater flexi flexibility is required. And one of the flexibility issues is, is, has to do with uh, debuggers, for example. Because remember, we, we kind of uh, uh, lose this uh, connection between the source program and the generated code when we do compilation. So, we, to conclude this, we, I, I just want to mention that uh, when we want to implement a language on many platforms, as is the case, for example, for Java, uh, the, the uh, standard way is actually to compile the programs to an intermediate language. So first we compile the programs to an intermediate language and then we implement an abstract machine, that means we implement an interpreter, we implement the intermediate language on various platforms. So for the case of Java, we can actually compile our Java program to an intermediate language and then transfer the compiled version, which is then in the intermediate language, which is Java bytecode, to different platforms and run them there because uh, an implementation of the Java virtual machine has been uh, carried out for the given platform. Well, that's the assumption. Uh, and this, uh, uh, so by doing this, we, we really make our programs uh, portable. And this was actually first time at, uh, for the first time, this was adopted by the Pascal language using uh, an intermediate language called P-code. And you can, you can read about that here on, on uh, Wikipedia. And as I have mentioned uh, uh, several times in this discussion, it is used currently by Java, whose abstract uh, machine or intermediate machine is called the Java virtual machine and the corresponding machine language is, is Java bytecode. And I've also pointed you here to the uh, to an article about Java bytecode where you can read more about this. So to conclude, uh, and this is actually an important note, uh, one should not talk about an interpreted language or a compiled language. Well, why not? Well, what do we mean by this? Interpreted language. For example, if I would say, well, uh, Java is, a, is an interpreted language, or Java is a compiled language. Well, uh, a language is not interpreted or compiled because, as we have been discussing, we can really both write an interpreter and a compiler for a language. So it's not the question of whether the language is being interpreted or compiled. It's just a matter of what kind of an uh, implementation have we chosen. So we should rather talk about an inter in interpretive or compiled implementation for the language. So I might write an interpreter for Java and another one which, which might uh, generate a Java bytecode. And uh, another person might write to decide, uh, decide to write uh, a compiler for Java, which directly generates m machine language for some given host machine. So it's not the, the question of uh, a language being interpreted or compiled. It's the question of what type of an impl implementation uh, is available.